Great. And so for the second talk today, we're very happy to have uh, Juan Maldacena that'll tell us about the proper time um, to the black hole singularity from thermal one point functions. Please go ahead, Juan. Okay, thanks to the organizers for organizing the wonderful meeting and for inviting me to talk about uh, to talk this meeting. So I'll be uh, talking about a um, paper that we wrote with um, Matan Greensberg. And uh, the title is, well, as you can see, the proper time to the black hole singularities in thermal one point functions. Now, um, if we have a black hole in ADS, uh, we have uh, we can consider the trajectory of a, of a per someone, an observer, who is uh, falling into the Schwarzschild black hole. And then uh, this person will live some time here in the black hole interior. And the time uh, that he or she will live here uh, is uh, less or equal than the time uh, from the horizon to the singularity. Because this one, if it is a little bit more boosted, the time will be shorter. So this is an interesting observable, the time from the horizon to the singularity. And this time uh, for typical, let's say examples in ADS-CFT, well, this time is of order the, the radius of ADS or shorter um, when you have a black hole in ADS. So if you have a black brain, uh, this time is of order the radius of ADS. And if you have a very small black hole in the center of ADS, uh, this time can be shorter than the radius, and it will be proportional always to well, be proportional to the Schwarzschild radius of that nearly flat space black hole. And so this time uh, in units of M Planck is proportional to n to the one quarter, um, so it's large in Planck units. But in units of the string length, which uh, sets the scale of locality of the theory, is proportional to lambda to the one quarter. So it would seem that in order to understand this time, uh, we need some some strong coupling. Uh, in the boundary theory. Um, and okay, and it's something that, uh, well, almost by definition is uh, sub ADS scale. And so one would like to understand it better. I, in this talk, uh, will just point out some properties of this time uh, from the point of view of the bulk. Uh, there will be no boundary theory understanding uh, just uh, from the bulk theory, but the idea is to rephrase or to, to think about some bulk calculation that uh, will, uh, so, so that we will be able to, to see this time uh, from the point of view of a boundary observable. Um, and so the idea here is to think about the wave function as a clock. So if you can create an annihilated particle, you uh, can measure time by the phase of the wave function. Um, and in order to do that, you need to well both create and annihilate the particle. So, and the idea is to the question is to find an observable that is sensitive to to this phase. And so, what we will argue is that if we look simply at the one point function of an operator uh, that is dual in the bulk to just a single massive particle, then um, the idea is that this one point function will be given by um, an exponential factor. So we only, if we focus at, on the dependence of, uh, of the mass, of the one-point function on the mass of the particle, and we look at the parts of the, the expectation value that depend exponentially on the mass, then those factors contain some geometric information. And they will contain a geometric information of the distance uh, from the boundary to the horizon. So that will be that's of course infinite, but we after regularization, the usual operator renormalization, that will be some regularized, uh, renormalized distance to the horizon. But in addition, as we will explain, it will contain a certain phase uh, that uh, encodes the time from the horizon to the singularity. Um, to define this phase, we'll have to take the imaginary part of the mass negative. Um, it's somewhat similar to what we saw in the previous talk of the causal symmetry breaking. So we, this, is, this happens whenever we have some singularities in the analytic structure of the mass. I'll, I'll discuss this of some variable. And then uh, if you approach from one side or approach from another side, you'll get different answers. In this case, we'll get different phases depending on how we approach. Here, I'm just saying uh, what we would get if uh, we took the imaginary part negative. And then the, the correlator could also have some powers of the mass that one could in principle compute, but 
uh, we're not going to focus on it on these powers so we're only going to focus throughout this talk on this exponential dependence and uh, the rest of the talk will be basically trying to explain uh, this formula and where it comes from so um, we'll uh, first uh, discuss how thermal one-point functions uh, arise from higher derivative corrections in the gravitational action in the gravitational theory then we'll discuss how we normally compute uh, correlators for large mass by using geodesics and so we'll have a geodesic approximation for the one-point function and then we'll discuss some explicit examples for black brains and we'll discuss uh, we'll see how to compute the explicit answer then we'll compute the geodesic approximation and then we'll uh, justify that geodesic approximation and then we'll see some other examples and include in a discussion of uh, charged black holes Maybe I should say that uh, perhaps uh, the, the main theme of this conference is well, using quantum information tools uh, to understand geometry. In that sense, this discussion is uh, the discussion here is a little bit more old fashioned in the sense that we're using particles and geodesics to explore the geometry of the bulk. And maybe in the future, one may be able to do it more geometrically, more from a quantum information aspect, which is perhaps even more less dependent on the details of the theory. Um, now, we'll start uh, with a minimally coupled scalar field. So that's related to the operator we are considering. Um, much of what we will discuss also holds for spinning fields and have some remark about that at the end. But just to be concrete, let's consider just simply a scalar field, a massive scalar field in the bulk. And such fields in this approximation have a zero one point function. Uh, thermal one point function due to the C2 symmetry of changing the field to minus the field. Um, however, in general, uh, we'll also have higher derivative corrections in the action. And these higher derivative corrections will couple to uh, derivatives of the Riemann tensor. And by field redefinitions, we can uh, think of this coupling uh, in terms of a coupling to the Weyl tensor squared. Uh, this has the advantage that it manifestly vanishes if we were in empty ideas, uh, which is what we expect. If we hadn't chosen this, we would uh, have to simply subtract the constant, appropriate constant to the field. Um, and so that's uh, this coupling physically, what it means is that this uh, massive field can decay to two gravitons. Uh, so that's one implication that this coupling will have in the flat space theory. Um, and in, uh, in string theory, these uh, couplings are present for generic massive string states. So we can think of the field phi as parameterizing or describing a massive string state. Um, and then in that case, this coupling here, which uh, has dimensions of length square in, uh, in the normalization that we've chosen here. So here we've chosen a normalization where uh, we pull out the one over G Newton in front. It's slightly unconventional for phi. So this phi uh, is dimensionless. And under this normalization, this alpha as uh, dimensions of length squared. And in a string theory example, uh, it would be of order alpha prime, so the, the inverse string tension. And in if we were thinking in a, the example of ADS5 times S5, for example, let's do a 20 equal to four supreme mills, this, um, this, this will lead to corrections, which are down by dimensionless numbers of order alpha or alpha prime divided by R squared. And this goes like one with dot coupling. So it's a suppressed uh, correction when gravity is a good description. But importantly, the suppression factor is just purely a power of uh, one over squared of lambda. Okay. Or it goes, if you wish, like one over some power of the mass of the, the field. So the mass of the field is of order lambda to the one quarter. And um, this uh, suppression factor is just the power of the mass. It's not exponential in the mass, and remind you, we are going to look for exponential terms. Um, so the idea is to uh, consider uh, this one-point function, and then uh, we can write down an expression for this one-point function that comes from this coupling, uh, which um, involves the propagator from the boundary uh, to the interior. And so this W square, we take just the background value, and so it's um, we have a source for the field phi and we just all we're doing is integrating um, over this source the source is stronger here near the tip but still finite uh, this is the, the euclidean black hole 
and then it uh, then we have the propagator all the way to the boundary leading to the one point function now whenever we are dealing with fields of large mass then we can uh, approximate the propagators by geodesics so if we were for example calculating a two point function or a three point function uh, we can approximate the propagators in terms of geodesics and this is a standard approximation that was uh, discussed uh, by many authors uh, previously. Um, so in particular, for example, if we were computing the Witten diagram for a three-point function, then uh, we would have propagators up to, for example, a middle point, and then we would integrate over this middle point, and we would also use a saddle point approximation for this middle point. So this middle point would be located at a special place where in some sense, the forces from these three uh, propagators uh, all cancel out. So uh, we can, uh, in this particular case, so we go back to uh, the calculation we were doing. So we are integrating this function. And this, boils, this will boil down to an integral over the radial position um, of a propagator that goes from the boundary uh, to this integration point. And then once we have it in this form, uh, we might use the saddle point for the integration in the R variable. So we try to attempt, if you attempt to do a saddle point, so we have to find the saddle that balances uh, these two terms. Um, and we would have a saddle point equation, which uh, roughly looks like this. So there's a term that comes from the variation of the length. And this term, importantly, is proportional to the mass, which is a large coefficient. And then uh, there is a term involving the variation of the value tensor. And the value tensor during in the Euclidean part of the manifold, um, so in the, in the exterior of the black hole, um, it's uh, perfectly, I mean, it varies fairly smoothly. So we will never be able to balance these two terms because this is will be relatively small compared to this, it has a large coefficient. However, if uh, the value of r is uh, close to the singularity, let's say r equal to zero, uh, then uh, we can uh, balance these two terms because this is singular, so we'll go like one over r, and if r is smaller, well, if, if we set the singularity at r equal to zero, then this term will go like one over r, and then by being very close to r equal to zero, we will be able to balance against uh, this other term. And so the idea is that the, um, the saddle point uh, will be at in general, perhaps uh, complex, in general would be complex value of R, um, but uh, it's very close to R equal to zero. So let's say R equal to I something small. Um, and because it's uh, close to there, then when we evaluate the actual uh, value of the integral, um, this term here uh, will be some power of the mass, um, but will be some power of R. So that it, like, sorry, maybe I should go back to this equation. So in this equation, there's also a question. Yeah, please. Uh, it's by Daniel Harlow. And yeah. Daniel, you should be allowed to talk now. Um, hi, Juan. I was just wondering, it, this doesn't, the picture you drew doesn't look like a geodesic because there's a corner at the bifurcate horizon. Can you just say something about that? Yeah, yeah. So the, this picture, what it, uh, what it shows, roughly speaking, is how we are evaluating the, the geodesic length, right? And um, as I'll discuss it a little more later, we are thinking of R as a complex variable. And uh, whenever we have a horizon, there is a, a cut in the proper, um, well, um, I, I think your question perhaps will be answered better later uh, when I discuss it in more detail. Um, and so um, you should think of this as happening in some complexified space. It just happens to be that in, in that space, this um, um, in that space, we are supposed to compute the length of a geodesic, and the correct way to compute the length is to add these two uh, segments. Um, I'm not sure if this answer is satisfactory for now, but I, I hope uh, it will be after a little while. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm going through in sort of uh, circles. So first uh, we'll see this qualitative version and then we'll see a more quantitative version later. Um, so the point I would want to make not right now is that, um, well, this uh, term, um, I'm sorry, I went back to this equation. So here goes, this term goes like one over R. So the deviation from the singularity, so further 
uh, one over the mass. And so this term will evaluate to some power of the mass. And this term will evaluate to the length uh, evaluated up to this R. Um, here we are extending beyond the natural uh, reach of R, which initially in the previous integral went from the horizon to infinity. And so we are extending the range of integration of R to even regions close to R equal to zero. That will make uh, this uh, term complex. Um, and uh, when we evaluate this at R star, in the end, uh, since it was near R equal to zero and the le this length is uh, finite, it's not diversion for anything near R equal to zero, we just can evaluate it at R equal to zero. And what this expression will give us is a normalized distance to the horizon plus this um, time to the singularity. And that was uh, the formula we were having before. Um, so just to orient you, just not to get lost in some details I'll discuss later. So the idea is that we have one point functions for fields with large mass that come from higher derivative corrections. And then we are just simply using the judicial approximation to compute them. And we find that there is a subtle point near the singularity. And so we have an answer that uh, encodes or contains the distance to the singularity. Notice that we are assuming that this higher derivative coupling is suppressed by powers of m and not exponentials in m. And this is true in string theory. And if we focus on the, this alpha prime dependent terms or, or well, fields which, whose masses are of order, the string scale. Uh, but one question we could ask is whether this subtle uh, contributes if it is not in the original integration context. So for that, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that in more details. But be before discussing that, we will work out uh, one particular example in detail, which is the case of a planar black brain. And so we'll do what uh, we'll do is we'll do the computation explicitly and then compare to that judicial analysis we discussed. So here uh, we are considering a black brain. So um, we have ADS in uh, D plus one dimensions and we have uh, the planar black brain. So we have translation for symmetry and flat space uh, along the minus one directions. And then we have the familiar uh, metric. So that's supposed to be dual to <coughs> the field theory uh, at finite temperature in flat space, flat, flat Euclidean space. So in those cases, the one point function has some temperature dependence and we won't uh, care too much about the temperature dependence. The temperature dependence um, comes basically from that renormalized length up to the horizon. And then uh, what we will mostly care about is about the dependence on the mass of the field or on the dimension of the, of the operator. And that's uh, what we want. Now, the, the relevant uh, computation was actually done uh, in this paper um, for some, uh, these authors in a particular dimension, but the actual computation is not very dependent on dimension. So the answer is basically the same in all dimensions. And you can find it in uh, here, it's written in, in all detail. Uh, so that's the answer, there's some propagator, which is some function, some special function, hypergeometric function. You can write it down, you can do the integral, you get some final answer. But the final answer, um, well, was this factor of temperature, then it has some number, some exponentials, some finite factors, like a factor, let's say four or something to the delta. Um, then there are powers of delta that we're not caring about. And then there is this one over sine of uh, delta pi delta over D. And this is the factor that uh, will contain the information that we are discussing. So, um, so we take this factor and we consider, of course, this expansion was for the case that delta is much bigger than one. And now if you take that the imaginary part of delta is uh, less than zero, then out of these two powers in sign, there will be one that dominates. And so we can expand and consider the other one to be subleading. Um, more precisely, we could say that delta uh, is, let's say the modulus of delta, and then we give it a small um, imaginary part here. So we're, we are moving in some angle in the complex delta plane. And, um, and then we make this modulus of delta very large. So under that, under those circumstances, when we take one over sine, we can uh, write it in this way. And this term uh, is small and dominates, and these are even smaller and are further suppressed. So the leading order contribution is uh, this factor. So this was the mechanism by which uh, we got the phase from the original real number. Of course, when delta is complex, this is not a pure phase. Um, but remember, we're just calling it a phase because it would be a phase if delta was uh, real. 
And this continuation also avoids uh, the zeros here in the denominator. We'll see just in a second what those zeros, uh, where those zeros come from. But before doing that, let's just uh, compare this uh, number that we got here with, um, this is just, if you wish, an experimental comparison. Um, by, uh, we compare that to the, the time to the singularity, and that we can compute by taking uh, the square root of this and then uh, integrating. So this variable c is equal to series at the boundary, c equal to one at the horizon, and then infinity, uh, it's far away. So we do this integral, this is a simple integral, and we get uh, r pi over d. And so tau times m, so tau was this time, what we just computed. Um, so uh, the factor of r together with the factor of m gives us the factor of dimension, and that uh, reproduces the answer we had before. So this is the answer from the previous page. Okay, so now, uh, so here it was sort of like an experimental check that what we were saying before was reasonable. So now we'll discuss the saddle point approximation to the integral in a little bit more detail. Um, so first uh, we encounter a problem when we try to analyze this integral. And it's the fact that if we have this uh, propagator um, and for a very large mass, this will somehow push this point uh, very close to the boundary. So it drives this point close to the boundary, even though there is some contribution here that decreases, it doesn't decrease fast enough to overwhelm the big pool from uh, this uh, propagator. Um, now, the reason we're having this is that uh, somehow it's telling us that the dominant thing this particle wants to do is to decay into two gravitons very close to the boundary. And, or said in another way, in another way, so if we, uh, we have some terms that dominate due to operator mixing uh, with, uh, let's say, lighter operators. So operators which uh, are of the form stress tensor to the nth, nth power. Um, and that uh, is an issue uh, whenever, in, in fact, the previous integral that we discussed, that explicit integral that uh, Myers and company were computing, um, is not conversion for delta uh, bigger than 2D. So that when, whenever we can decay at least two of them, uh, will not be conversion. Now, when we, when we had the previous discussion, what we did was to define it by analytic continuation. And this uh, amounts to a subtraction of all the lower dimension operators it can, in principle, mix with. And we saw that the function that we discussed had a po had poles when delta was n times d, and this is precisely the poles that appear when we can mix with uh, exactly n stress tensors. And those, um, so at, at those those positions, we cannot say what the answer is. It's a little more complicated. Uh, because the operators need to be, um, the operator mixing matrix has to be diagonalized already to lead in order in the one over n perturbation theory. But when delta is different from n over d, we can um, really talk about this operator and uh, compute this one point function one over n perturbation theory. So that's uh, what we are talking about. Um, so the integral is uh, naively infinite due to the contribution of this uh, multiple gravitons. Um, but our objective is to focus on the operator in question uh, and we choose n, which is different from n over d. So in that case, the problem uh, should be well-defined. And we, one option, if we can do the integral exactly, is to define it by analytic continuation. But uh, if we don't know it exactly and we are trying to do a saddle point approximation, uh, we can define it so that it converges. And so we can do that by choosing a different contour near the boundary. And this is uh, particularly nice if you uh, first uh, make a delta complex as we were doing it before, then um, we were integrating, for example, the function we discussed before between the boundary at c equal to zero and the horizon at c equal to one. So this was the blue line was the original naive contour of integration, but we can choose another contour of integration, which somehow spirals in and uses the fact that delta has a small imaginary part to provide a conversion factor and make uh, the integral finite. A very similar uh, spiraling contours 
were discussed in the context of string perturbation theory or the Venetiano amplitude uh, in some discussions by Witten, where he was discussing the IE epsilon prescription in string theory. Um, so so we, we, we changed the integration contour. And so now we have a convergent integral and we can ask uh, what is the saddle point approximation to this convergent integral. Um, we can define a new variable rho, uh, which is given by the proper length, and it's related to the variable c by uh, this formula that we have here. And in that, uh, in the rho plane, now uh, the horizon here is at uh, rho equal to zero, and um, the boundary is at rho equal to infinity, so the blue line uh, here is the original integration contour. And then the singularity is in uh, these variables is at some finite row, at uh, row equal to i pi. And actually, um, uh, there is in this parametrization, uh, there is an infinite number of copies of the singularities separated by 2 pi i in these units. Now, that spiraling contour that we discussed uh, previously uh, translates into a contour that goes to infinity in the row plane at some finite angle. So it goes. Uh, follows uh, roughly this red line uh, going to infinity at a finite at its finite angle. And so um, the function we want to integrate along the blue contour, uh, it was rising. So it was rising in this in the right towards the right part of the before we made delta imaginary, it was rising here when we went to the right and uh, was uh, decreasing when we go to the left. When we make delta slightly imaginary, it also somehow de barely decreases along the red line, but we can continue, we can deform the integration contour to, towards the left part of the plane where it decreases more faster. And then um, it turns out that, um, that we can uh, deform the contour so that it passes through all these saddle points. Um, so saddle points are located roughly at these locations. And so when uh, we deform the contour, we decompose this contour into a bunch of contours that all pass uh, through a saddle point. And that's, uh, in a sense, when, what we normally do in, when we apply the saddle point method. We deform the original contour into uh, contours that are steepest descent. So they pass through the saddle point and then uh, decrease uh, continuously uh, with constant imaginary part. And so we can, th these are the contours with steepest descent. Um, when we do that, then this uh, Liden saddle, this, uh, this saddle here, uh, gives us the, um, this contribution, which is the one we expected uh, in general. And in this case, we also get some bonus, which is that the, all these other uh, saddles um, give us uh, these factors here in the denominator. So if we expanded this in powers, we would get those powers. Well, we do get those powers from the other saddles. Now, there are some uh, details we did not uh, fully justify that have to do with certain prefactors that appear in the uh, propagator that seem to produce extra singularities. And we did not take them into account uh, uh, in this discussion of the resummation of the other saddles. The, those details are not important for the first saddle but they show up later. And Juan, there's a question by Edward yes. Witten. Please. Uh, Edward, you should be able to talk now. And first, and yes. my question is what about the negative row axis? Because your picture makes it look like you have the sum of infinite many saddles plus the negative row axis. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Uh, well, um, we discussed that in the paper and I, I was planning to gloss over this. Um, the point, uh, let me see. Uh, mm -hmm. Go back. I light slightly. Um, so when uh, you look at the propagators, there is actually uh, this propagator, which is the one that I was discussing. But there is another way to go to this point, which is to what we can call the long propagator. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when we um, when we approximate the propagator in terms of geodesics, we have to have the sum of two terms. There is the sum of the short contribution, which is the one that I've been discussing explicitly, plus an extra term, which is this long contribution. Um, now, the long contribution has the nice feature that when you take it all the way to the boundary, 
it decreases because uh, it becomes longer and longer. And so that's a conversion contribution. And it uh, turns out that uh, that integral over the long contribution pre becomes precisely equal to the one uh, that um, that we were discussing. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. So it becomes uh, precisely equal to this one here. Okay. This is, um, yeah, you need to take into account the prefactors, the propagator and so on, but uh, you can check that this is true. Uh, I was sort of glossing over that. Um, so the summary is that we consider the specific example, the black brain, and we did the integral analytically, and we matched it against the saddle point contribution and analyzed the integral in the saddle point for large mass and explained why the saddle point contributes via this counter rotation argument. So now what we will do is we will explore just the saddles for other black holes, but without doing the full analysis of whether they do or do not contribute. So we will assume that they do contribute. And just, uh, I will tell you what uh, they give. Uh, so first uh, we'll discuss uh, some Schwarzschild ADS black holes. Um, so this is uh, the familiar metric. And so now uh, the dependence on the radial position is a little uh, more complicated. Um, and when we find the proper distance, what we will have to do is uh, do this integral. And so because uh, F has zeros, there are some branch cuts in this integral. And so when we do the integral, we have to decide how we go through these branch cuts. And of course, uh, the, the fact that when F becomes negative, we get an imaginary part, that is what explains uh, why we had the extra I in the, in the expressions we were discussing. And that extra uh, negative sign is also related to the time. Uh, well, th th this point is related to the answer to uh, Dan's question. So by doing an integral pure linear, so from let's say infinity to the horizon, we get uh, part of that uh, line that we were drawing in the Penrose diagram. And then by continue that integral to uh, smaller values of R, so values that are inside the black hole, um, this is still a, an integral over R. Uh, we get uh, here some imaginary part, and that's equal to uh, the time inside the singularity because R becomes time left. Um, okay. Um, so here, um, so let's say we take first the five dimensional case. So in the five dimensions, uh, this um, um, it turns out that all the powers that appear here, so in five dimensions, this D is four, so this powers are both even. We can define a new variable u, which is r squared. And then the structure of singularity is very, very simple. There are two points where f vanishes. And uh, so it, f vanishes at the horizon. And then there is the singularity. And then it vanishes also somewhere else. Um, so the simplest, uh, so we're doing some integral that comes from infinity, goes to the horizon. So that would be the same for everyone. And then uh, we have the option of uh, going to uh, the singularity in the most direct route, or going to the singularity through some other uh, through some other path. And the idea is that uh, this will give one possible saddle point, and then this will give other possible saddle points. Okay, similar to the many copies of the saddle point. So before um, I, we just discussed the explicit form of rho, the, the mapping between rho and the radial coordinate, and we saw that we had many images of a saddle point. And one way to understand those many images is that we're going around the radial. Well, we're, we're, we're going around these cuts uh, many times. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this is just a mathematical explanation, but that's uh, the origin of the many copies that we had before. So in this case, uh, we can, going through the first copy gives us something, and that gives uh, the naive uh, time to the singularity, and these other ones uh, give us something that in general will be smaller. So this sign to chi zero is uh, equal to this formula in terms of the radial position of the horizon, r plus. So here u plus because it's just the square. Now we can recover the black brain limit by taking uh, u plus to infinity. Uh, and if we sum over these two saddles, then uh, we, we get a result similar to what we had before. So the idea is that this denominator would come from going many times around. Um, and um, and then if we had these two saddles with uh, exactly the same coefficient, uh, then uh, we 
we would we recover the answer we had before. Um, okay. Um, so that's uh, that story, and of course uh, we can also make uh, this very small, and then we have something that looks closer to the flat space black hole. Um, so one comment about uh, this pole. So the the position of the poles here comes simply from uh, from going around a full circle um, from the, the the length that, that comes from going around the full circle. And it's a property that, so that full circle, we can deform all the way to infinity. So the spacing of the poles depends only on the structure of the theory near the boundary. And in fact, it's related to the dimensions of uh, operators of this kind. So the stress tensor to the M, which is what we had for, we discussed that more explicitly when we were discussing the black brain, but also we could have operators of this kind. So uh, stress tensor and then many derivatives act on the stress tensor. So these derivatives are spread between the two. and um, um, these operators were zero on the black brain because uh, we had a translation symmetry, um, but they are non-zero when we consider the black hole with a spherical boundary. Um, and so in the end, the poles can be when delta is equal to 2n uh, for, for this case. And what is happening um, is that so the poles, the, the poles are fixed, the location of the poles are com is completely fixed by the structure of the theory near the boundary, but the position of these uh, two terms, uh, the position of, uh, if you wish, the zeros in the numerator, or the numerator uh, form here, uh, depends on the details of the black hole. This is what we get for the black brain, um, but in general, uh, here we'll get two different factors, which uh, uh, will depend on the mass of the black hole. So for the black brain, these, two, these become this and reproduce the answer we had before. So they are canceling uh, one of the poles, one series of poles, half of the poles. Um, now, if we looked at the Schwarzschild ADS black holes. So this looks like a more complicated story, but I only want to draw your attention to one, one feature, uh, which uh, changes a little bit the story that I was, I was, well, makes it slightly more complicated than I was telling you about. Um, so in that case, um, well, of course we can look at, this is the same story. So we look at the function F as a function of R and then there is some structure of branch cut. So F by becomes zero at the horizon and then uh, becomes also zero at some other complex locations. And now um, we can go around uh, C0. We, we can look, go around the simplest contour. So this is the most obvious contour, the one that will give you the time to the singularity. So chi zero is just the time to the singularity, the integral between R zero and R plus of uh, dr of square root of f. Um, but then there are some other uh, other contours. And this, these other uh, contributions are uh, have a larger imaginary part, but they can also have some real part. And Surprisingly, this uh, real part can be positive. And what that means is that when we, so in, in evaluating the, uh, the one point function, we'll have terms that go like n to the, this rows with we were defining this proper distance from the horizon. Um, and so that means that if the imaginary part of delta is small, then uh, this other uh, saddle will dominate over the one we were talking about before. On the other hand, if we want this one, to dominate, we can just simply make uh, the imaginary part uh, relatively large. So the, the story I was telling you about um, holds when you, we make this imaginary part relatively large. Now, this, uh, this contribution seems to uh, come from uh, parts of the integral that, uh, parts of the integral of, over W square, which are far from the black hole, but within, uh, somehow within an ADS radius. So we didn't have that in the case of this four dimension, the, the case of the five dimensional black hole, but in this case, uh, we have apparently a significant contribution uh, from that, that region. Now, something somewhat similar happens in the case of charged black holes. Um, so um, in the charged black hole, the idea is that the picture we will get for the cells looks uh, something like this. I'll discuss it in more detail in a second. So we'll have integral uh, from the boundary to the horizon, then from the outer horizon to the inner horizon. So this surface here is the outer horizon. Then we have here the inner horizon. So we have the integral to the inner horizon. 
And then we have another space like contribution to the to some singularity. So that's an interpretation of the answer. So the again, what we simply do is we look at the paths in the uh, complex R plane. So we look at the zeros of f. And again, we have the simplest uh, in way to get to the singularity. It's just uh, we go from the outer horizon to the inner horizon, and then we continue inwards. And in doing so, we'll get uh, this imaginary contribution, which reflects the time between the two horizons. And then we'll get a real contribution similar to the one we discussed for the 4D black hole. But we have, in this case, uh, its origin, geometric origin is more clear. Um, we have that contribution, which um, is, again, uh, positive. And so these are all the various uh, potential subtle contributions. And uh, the important point here is this leading subtle has uh, this gamma zero, which is positive. Um, and so if we look at just that contribution, we can interpret this as the time between the inner and outer horizon. And this positive contribution um, leads to a finite contribution in the, ext in the extremal limit. So what happens, the math is such that um, this uh, contribution comes with a sign such that we should really we should really take the difference between this geodesic length and uh, this geodesic length. Uh, that's what the, the significance of this uh, positive sign is. Um, and so in that case, in the extremal limit, so when we take the extremal limit, this length, uh, this renormalized length becomes longer and longer. And so does uh, this length and so, so does gamma naught. Um, but the contribution of this finite subtle uh, to the full one point function uh, ends up being finite. Okay. So for that reason, we imagine that this is uh, associated to uh, the exterior connecting region. So it's, con it's really uh, the contribution of uh, W squared uh, or the decay of this uh, field in the exterior region of the black hole. So the region that connects the higher dimensional ADS to the ADS2 region. Um, Okay. Um, and this is the five minute warning. Okay. And then we have another sub leading saddle that uh, it turns out that one of the other contours that I discussed um, has uh, raw equal to, well, the same real factor, but uh, the opposite sign for this gamma. Node. And this leads to some part of the one point function that goes like, uh, that depends on the temperature and goes to zero in the extremal limit. So this uh, is the part that we would associate uh, more to the ADS2 region. And uh, so th that is associated to the ADS2 region that depends on the temperature. So if we were to compare this to some, uh, some hypothetical field theory that describes only the ADS2 region, then uh, we would say that this uh, first part of the one point function would just uh, subtract completely and we only retain uh, this uh, other part, which uh, has this temperature dependence. Um, now, let me now comment a little bit on higher spin operators. So if we consider a one-point function of higher spin operators, uh, we expect a similar story. So in general, they can couple to, uh, to, to gravitons, and they, indicate, they can decay to gravitons. So they, we will have the, the higher curvature couplings we discussed. And they, this in particular, this discussion uh, says that they are non-zero and they can be calculated by these geodesics we were talking about. Now, at weak coupling, these one-point functions are weak uh, gauge theory couplings. The one-point functions of higher spin operators are definitely non-zero, and they continue to be non-zero at the uh, strong coupling. But their contribution to the OP thermal OP of two-point functions is very suppressed. So the idea is, uh, well, as explained in these many papers, that um, if you take the two-point function at finite temperature, um, you can, in principle, do an OPE expansion and calculate it in terms of expectation values of the various operators. And in order to reproduce the gravity answers, what we would like is that, or what, what we see that happens is that only the stress tensor operators uh, contribute in the gravity regime. And all these uh, higher spin uh, fields are will have smaller one-point functions. And they're mainly suppressed by their high dimension. Um, I should emphasize that this fact that we, we should not view uh, this calculation as a literal probe of the interior, especially of the Lorentzian interior of the black hole, is somehow an indirect uh, probe of that geometry. 
for example, um, if we have the thermophile double and we send in a perturbation from the left, the one point function on the right will be unchanged. But let's say the time, the Lorentzian time between the horizon and the singularity will be changed. Okay. So, uh, so we should not read too much into, uh, well, it's not giving us a direct probe of the Lorentzian interior of the black hole. It's just uh, some gives us a probe of the thermophile double, perhaps, uh, and maybe it might help us in the future to understand the singularity. Um, this type of uh, calculation is somewhat similar in spirit to the paper uh, by Fikoski, Rubini, Klevan, and Schenker, where they looked at the sing as they looked at the signature of the black hole singularity directly in a two-point function, and they had to do a somewhat sophisticated analytic continuation. So uh, here, the analytic continuation is a little simpler, but also the information we get is uh, a little a bit more limited in the sense that we don't see a singularity, which I see. Uh, simply these times that we can extract from the mass dependence of the one-point functions. So we discussed thermal one-point functions. We saw that the dependence on the mass encodes interesting information about the times to the singularity. And we needed to do some analytic continuation in a parameter, uh, for example, the top captain of the gauge theory, that results in analytic continuation of the mass in order to extract this information. If we had a theory with fixed masses and so on, we couldn't do this. Or perhaps if we had a theory with a range of masses, we could uh, do something like this. Um, but my hope is that this perhaps helps in understanding the, the singularity in some way. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. So uh, questions now? now um, I will give priority to panelists that cannot raise their hands. So uh, <laughs> they had to message me directly to ask for questions. So first Neta had a question. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk, Juan. Um, so can you comment on how this might generalize to one-sided dynamical black holes? Um, no, I really cannot comment too much. Um, when, when we compute uh, these expectation values using geodesics, it's, um, we are not really probing the Lorentzian dynamics. Uh, and this we can understand even in flat space. If we have uh, two points in flat space and we, in the vacuum, and we compute the two point function using geodesic, right? The geodesic goes between these two points. But you could imagine doing at some earlier time some perturbation between the two points, but within, in, so that the two initial points are outside the Lycon of the perturbation. So that will def definitely change the fields in that region, but the two point function is still given by the geodesic in the original let's say flat space or undisturbed space. So um, these geodesics are giving us some information, but not the information, not the not real time information if you wish. They are, um, they're, I don't know how to say exactly what information, I mean, it seems from the calculation that it's giving us some information, um, but uh, it's different from the experiences of an observer that falls in and, something like that. And of course, it would be more interesting to understand those. But this is uh, something more limited that one can do. Thank you. Sure. If you wanted to have something more, let me just follow up on that. If you wanted to have something more one-sided, could you look at an OPE coefficient between the string mode and two uh, high energy energy eigenstates? Um, that would be so that that's like, so it would be the dependence in the OPE coefficients of, on, of lambda. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, yes, you, 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 you're, you're thinking of, uh, of doing this in the vacuum or? Yeah, yeah, three, it's a, it's a three point function in, in the vacuum. Ah, 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 okay, okay, you're thinking about the black hole microstate. Yeah, the black hole, mic like a three point uh, function with black hole microstates, yeah. Yeah, yeah, one, one could do that. I'm, I'm, I would expect that this one point function would be given by the same formulas. Um, Right. That we're discussing. If, if that black hole microstate is generic, we would maybe we guess. And, but maybe we can combine it with uh, with other talks, with the previous talk and other talks which talk about typical states. And so that uh, these results probably will, I mean, are an average or what you expect in various states. It, perhaps it would be interesting to understand how strong is the deviation from the average. Um, 
I should say that this one point functions that we were discussing here in the context of string theory are relatively large. So they are in, in n power counting, they are of order the same order as the, let's say, expectation value of the stress tensor. They are just further suppressed by inverse powers of lambda and uh, maybe exponentials in, lam in lambda and so on, but not in n. So they are different from, um, let's say, these uh, suppressed correlators that, for example, we saw in the previous talk or that uh, are, are normally now discussed, which are suppressed by uh, the powers of n or even exponentials in n. Uh, Thanks. Uh, so the next question was by Julian, and then uh, I'll get to the rest of the room. Julian, please go ahead. Yeah, my question is actually is similar to Nada's, but maybe um, still worth asking. Uh, so yeah, you use this analytic continuation, which does seem to really depend very, um, say, delicately on the fact that you have a particular metric, right? So now mm -hmm. typically we say that local observables don't really probe the interior, but you know you you were able to extract something about the interior from an analytic continuation of the local observable. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a perhaps a physical process that is associated to this that you can then use to extend it to other space times? Well, I, I think I think this is probing the interior in the same sense that the when you calculate the geodesic in, even in flat space is probing the geometry between this, those two points in flat space. As we just discussed, if we you, you change it uh, but keep the correlations, right? You will uh, continue to have the same two-point function. So now in this case, there is one way to write the the answer, which only depends on the black hole exterior, right? So the original integral only involves the black hole exterior. Um, so nevertheless, you can reproduce it in terms of uh, something that goes into the interior. So I, I don't have a deeper explanation. I mean, some you, you could say that maybe always the black hole interior is some kind of analytic continuation. Of, uh, some but that, the, but that may not be but, true, right? Well, that, that is certainly not true for some things. So I mean, if you that, that so that was precisely the the gist um, where I'm trying to drive. Well, um, I mean we, we can certainly so in this example where we send in a particle in the in this example, right? Mm -hmm. I mean it's clear clear that whatever the observer from the left encounters is not some analytic continuation of the state in the right, right? Right. Um, so that is different, um, but. Uh, um, for for the purposes of what we were discussing, it is. Um, so where, if you might remember this, but there was actually some something with um, a paper that we wrote with Tarek Anus and with uh, Anton Rovai and with Tom Hartman, where we looked at non-local observers like entanglement entropy in a dynamical black hole. Mm -hmm. That also gets a, a contribution from a complex uh, saddle point, but this does contribute a geodesic that actually goes into the interior of a dynamical black hole. Right. So for non-local observables, uh, somehow there's, you know, it's, it's, to me, it seems, I don't know how to say this, it seems more likely that they can go into the interior to some extent because of causality, right? But for local ones, because of causality, you think it's difficult. Um, well, I think this is a general question you can raise generally whenever we do some computation, even about uh, entanglement entropy whether it's really probing the interior or some, you know, some sense in some analytic continuation. Of course, the recent uh, developments suggest that entanglement entropy is a better probe than all these uh, Euclidean probes I was discussing. That's why in the yeah. beginning, I said that perhaps there is a better way to do this, just you thinking about entanglement entropy. Yeah, I somehow wanted to associate but, that to the uh, non-locality, but maybe you're right. Maybe, maybe we are also even reading too much about entanglement entropy, but I, yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's contrary to the spirit of the recent developments, anyway. But Mark, I mean, it, it seems from the recent developments that the entanglement entropy really is a better probe of the Lorentzian interior. Um, the next Thank question is by Daniel. Oh, sorry. The next question is by Daniel Harlow. Um, you should be allowed to unmute yourself and talk. Yeah, hi Juan. Um, I was wondering about, uh, so yeah, it's a little bit annoying that you have to do complex masses, right? Like it, I'm not really sure how to do that directly from n equals four, but I, I was wondering 
could you maybe do something by uh, using particles that are unstable in the bulk? Is That's a bit like having a complex mass. If you have some CFT operator that creates a long-lived particle, um, then when, could you avoid having to go to complex delta? Yeah, well, th this, these particles are unstable. Um, and so there is some imaginary part to their masses, but um, those imaginary parts are of higher order in the one over n expansion. Um, um, I prefer to think that, uh, well, that all we are doing is just making lambda complex, right? So this, uh, well, I didn't say that, but a simple way to make uh, this mass is complex in the, an example like n equal to four super young males is to make lambda complex. So the masses go like uh, lambda to the one quarter. And if you make lambda complex, they would become complex. This is, uh, if you wish, a practical way to make them complex if you were able to do the Yamil's theory computation. Yeah, I see. But then, then I guess the geometry would also change if you made lambda complex, right? Well, the, the gravity geometry, the leading order gravity geometry will not change because it's, uh, it's independent of lambda. Um, I mean, well, the, the- At the, higher orders, I guess it would change. Yeah, right? at higher orders it would, yeah. But the idea is they would change by powers. So they're, well, the, Terms like these higher order corrections or uh -huh. of other operators. Um, but somehow, yeah. if you happen to have uh, some non trivial particle physics in the bulk where you had a particle who's, which was unstable, not with the lifetime suppressed by one over n, then maybe you could use that without having to make anything non unitary. Yeah, that, that is possible. Yeah. Yeah, that is also possible. Yes. All right, thanks. What's interesting, yeah, I find interesting that you know, in some sense the particle has a small probability of decaying so somehow far away from the black hole, but when it gets to the singularity, of course, the background, the, the gravitational background is so big that it basically decays. That, that's one way to understand the, the reason that the particle goes all the way to the singularity. Mm -hmm. This is again qualitative. Uh, All right, the next question is uh, by Ricardo Troncoso. So you should be able to unmute yourself and talk. Sure. Juan, it, in three space time dimensions, the vial tensor identically vanishes. And so the question is how to proceed in the case of a BTC black hole? Yeah, very, very good question. So, yeah, this discussion was for higher than three dimensions, so four and higher dimensions. And uh, in three dimensions, there was uh, a nice paper that I didn't mention by um, Maloney and maybe uh, I forget the other authors um, that discussed the, the computation of two three-point functions. And they, they, they noticed that the, well, the, the three-point function comes from a process where this particle that we were discussing with mass M somehow decays into two other particles that wrap around the horizon. So you need that the horizon has finite length. And um, so it, uh, it has to be really a BTC black hole and not just a black string. Because for a black string, the underlying conformal symmetry forces all one point functions to be zero. Um, and um, they, they found some expressions uh, for these three point functions and some nice uh, Cardi-like formulas uh, for it. Um, and I, I we suspect that this, the same uh, dependence on the mass should be contained within their formulas, but uh, it wasn't in their paper and we, we didn't really redo the analysis to see whether uh, it was also there. I mean, it was not their main focus of the paper to find these things. But, um, uh, so that's a quick summary. Uh, they, were mainly, they, were, they were mainly focused on finding the sort of what we are calling here the real parts, the real terms. Uh, the, exponentially suppressed real parts. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right, the next question, and maybe the last one in the essence of time, is by Karen Fernandez. So please unmute yourself. Hi, Juan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was just wondering if there are any complications in carrying out this uh, construction in Dissiter in the sense of uh, we can use the bulk constructions to try to probe aspects of thermal correlation functions in this setup. Does anything go wrong in this? Um, we, we didn't think about it. Um, so you imagine that the thermal one-point function in the 
static patch could be given by some yes. that goes outside. Yes, um, and the interpretation would be opposite because in this case, because of the analytic continuation, it would be real in like the super horizon modes and like the sub horizon region would be like in, in decaying. And I mean, it, there might be some interesting stuff <laughs> going on there. So is there uh, any yeah. complication? Uh, uh, I have to say that I haven't thought about it, so I don't know. Uh, okay, thank you. Great, so um, let's uh, conclude our session now and I'll thank Juan again for the very nice talk. Again, only one that can clap. Um, so just a few words. Sorry, I got muted. As of right now, you can log on to the GatherTown platform. So please uh, go on there and, um, and socially interact virtually. Um, we will reconvene um, at, well, let me just say in two hours because there's too many different time zones. So in two hours, we will reconvene for the two talks of the afternoon. Uh, please do check your emails before you log on to this afternoon because we're gonna try to get the Zoom room fixed to something more conventional. So uh, before logging on this afternoon or this evening, um, please check your emails again to see if we sent out an updated link and uh, see you all on, on GatherTown. And for all the residual questions that we can ask, uh, go ahead and post on Slack. All right, thanks a lot, everyone. See you in GatherTown. <laughs>